The history of education began with teaching of traditional elements such as Indian religions, Indian mathematics, Indian logic at early Hindu and Buddhist centers of learning such as ancient Takshashila in modern-day Pakistan and Nalanda in India before the Common Era. Islamic education became ingrained with the establishment of the Islamic empires in the Indian subcontinent in the Middle Ages while the coming of the Europeans later brought Western education to colonial India. A series of measures continuing throughout the early half of the 20th century ultimately laid the foundation of education in the Republic of India, education in Pakistan and much of South Asia. Early history Early education in India commenced under the supervision of a guru or prabhu. Initially, education was open to all and seen as one of the methods to achieve moksha in those days, or enlightenment. As time progressed, due to superiority complexes, the education was imparted on the basis of caste and the related duties that one had to perform as a member of a specific caste. The Brahmins learned about scriptures and religion while the Kshatriya were educated in the various aspects of warfare. The Vaishya caste learned commerce and other specific vocational courses. The other Kastashudras, were more of working class and they were trained on skills to carry out these jobs. The earliest venues of education in India were often secluded from the main population. Students were expected to follow strict monastic guidelines prescribed by the Guru and stay away from cities and ashrams. However, as population increased under the Gupta Empire centers of urban learning became increasingly common and cities such as Varanasi and the Buddhist center at Nalanda became increasingly visible, education in India as a piece of education traditional form was closely related to religion. Among the heterodox schools of belief were the Jain and Buddhist schools. Heterodox Buddhist education was more inclusive and aside of the monastic orders the Buddhist education centers were urban institutes of learning such as Taxila and Nalanda where grammar, medicine, philosophy, logic, metaphysics, arts and crafts etc. were also taught. Early secular Buddhist institutions of higher learning like Taxila and Nalanda continued to function well into the Common Era and were attended by students from China and Central Asia. On the subject of education for the nobility Joseph Prabhu writes. Outside the religious framework, kings and princes were educated in the arts and sciences related to government, politics economics philosophy and historical traditions Here the authoritative source was Kautilya's Arthashastra, often compared to Niccolò Machiavelli's The Prince for its worldly outlook and political scheming. The R. G. Veda mentions female poets called Brahmavadinis, specifically Lopamudra and Gosha. By 800 BCE women such as Gargi and Maitreyi were mentioned as scholars in the religious Upanishads. Maya, mother of the historic Buddha, was an educated queen while other women in India contributed to writing of the Pali Canon. Out of the composers of the Sangam literature 154 were women. However, the education and society of the era continued to be dominated by educated male population. <laughs> Early Common Era — High Middle Ages Chinese scholars such as Xuanzang and Yi Jing arrived in Indian institutions of learning to survey Buddhist texts. Yi Jing additionally noted the arrival of 56 scholars from India, Japan, and Korea. However, the Buddhist institutions of learning were slowly giving way to a resurgent tradition of Brahmanism during that era. Scholars from India also journeyed to China to translate Buddhist texts. During the 10th century a monk named Dharmadeva from Nalanda journeyed to China and translated a number of texts. Another center at Vikramshila maintained close relations with Tibet. The Buddhist teacher Atisa was the head monk in Vikramshila before his journey to Tibet. Examples of royal patronage include construction of buildings under the Rastrakuta dynasty in 945 CE. The institutions arranged for multiple residences for educators as well as state sponsored education and arrangements for students and scholars. Similar arrangements were made by the Chola dynasty in 1024 CE, which provided state support to selected students in educational establishments. Temple schools from 12 to 13 th centuries included the school at the Nataraja temple situated at Chidambaram which employed 20 librarians, out of whom eight were copiers of manuscripts and two were employed for verification of the copied manuscripts. 
The remaining staff conducted other duties, including preservation and maintained of reference material. Another establishment during this period is the Udendapura Institute, established during the 8th century under the patronage of the Pala dynasty. The institution developed ties with Tibet and became a center of Tantric Buddhism. During the 10 to 11 th centuries, the number of monks reached a thousand, equaling the strength of monks at the sacred Mahabodhi complex. By the time of the arrival of the Islamic scholar Al Biruni, India already had an established system of science and technology in place. Also by the 12th century, invasions from India's northern borders disrupted traditional education systems as foreign armies raided educational institutes, among other establishments. Late Middle Ages — Early Modern Era With the advent of Islam in India the traditional methods of education increasingly came under Islamic influence. Pre-Mughal rulers such as Qutbud Din Ibak and other Muslim rulers initiated institutions which imparted religious knowledge. Scholars such as Nizamuddin Aliya and Moinuddin Chishti became prominent educators and established Islamic monasteries. Students from Bukhara and Afghanistan visited India to study humanities and science. Islamic institution of education in India included traditional madrasas and maktabs which taught grammar, philosophy, mathematics, and law influenced by the Greek traditions inherited by Persia and the Middle East before Islam spread from these regions into India. A feature of this traditional Islamic education was its emphasis on the connection between science and humanities. Among the centers of education in India was 18th century Delhi was the Madrasa Rahimiya under the supervision of Shah Walula, an educator who favored an approach balancing the Islamic scriptures and science. The course at the Madrasa Rahimiya prescribed two books on grammar, one book on philosophy, two books on logic, two books on astronomy and mathematics, and five books on mysticism. Another centre of prominence arose in Lucknow under Mullah Nizamuddin Salawi, who educated at the Farangi Mahal and prescribed a course called the Dars i Nizami, which combined traditional studies with modern and laid emphasis on logic. The education system under the rule of Akbar adopted an inclusive approach with the monarch favouring additional courses, medicine, agriculture, geography, and texts from other languages and religions, such as Patanjali's work in Sanskrit. The traditional science in this period was influenced by the ideas of Aristotle, Bhaskara II, Sharaka and Ibn Sina. This inclusive approach was not uncommon in Mughal India. The more conservative monarch Aurangzeb also favoured teaching of subjects which could be applied to administration. The Mughals, in fact, adopted a liberal approach to sciences and as contact with Persia increased the more intolerant Ottoman school of Mankal education came to be gradually substituted by the more relaxed Makal school. The Middle Ages also saw the rise of private tuition in India as state failed to invest in public education system. A tutor, or Riyazi, was an educated professional who could earn a suitable living by performing tasks such as creating calendars or generating revenue estimates for nobility. Another trend in this era is the mobility among professions, exemplified by Qaim Khan, a prince famous for his mastery in crafting leather shoes and forging cannons. <laughs> Traditional schools Prior to the British era, education in India commenced under the supervision of a guru in traditional schools called gurukuls. The gurukuls were supported by public donation and were one of the earliest forms of public school offices. However these gurukuls catered only to the upper castes of the Indian society and the overwhelming masses were denied any formal education. Before the introduction of British education, indigenous education was given higher importance from early time to colonial era. In every Indian village which has retained anything of its form. The rudiments of knowledge are sought to be imparted. There is not a child, except those of the outcasts, who form no part of the community, who is not able to read, to write, to cipher. In the last branch of learning, they are confessedly most proficient. According to an 1823 6 survey in the Madras Presidency, 11,758 schools, and 740 centres for higher education were identified in the Presidency, and with the exception of a few European missionary schools, were funded and managed at a community level. 
The number of students was recorded as 161,667, with 157,644 boys, and 4,023 girls, or approximately one in six boys of school age, which was better than the one in eight boys identified by a similar exercise in the Bombay Presidency. According to the Adams Enquiry, around 1835 there existed approximately 100,000 village schools in the Bengal Presidency, offering an education to 13.2% of boys. Though the standard of instruction was criticized as rudimentary, well below European standards, and cultivating little more than memory. After the introduction of British education, the numbers of these indigenous education institutes decreased drastically. In the Punjab, Dr. Leitner, the principal of the Oriental College and Government College, Lahore, estimated that in 1854–1855 there were at least 30,000 schools, and assuming 13 pupils per school the total number of pupils was approximately 400,000, in the region. <laughs> <laughs> Colonial era The Jesuits introduced India to both the European college system and the printing of books, through founding St. Paul's College, Goa in 1542. The French traveller François Pirard de Laval, who visited Goa c. 1608, described the College of St. Paul, praising the variety of the subjects taught there free of charge. Like many other European travellers who visited the college, he recorded that at this time it had 3,000 students, from all the missions of Asia. Its library was one of the biggest in Asia, and the first printing press was mounted there. <inaudible> British India As a result of decades of lobbying by the likes of William Wilberforce, and Charles Grant, the 1813 renewal of East India Company's charter carried a duty to educate, and assist previously excluded Christian missionaries to educate the population, in addition to the company's corporate activities. The company's officers were divided as to how to implement this imposed duty, with the Orientalists, who believed that education should happen in Indian languages of which they favoured classical or court languages like Sanskrit or Persian, while the utilitarians also called Anglicists like Lord William Bentinck, and Thomas Macaulay, strongly believed that traditional India had nothing to teach regarding modern skills, the best education for them would happen in English. Macaulay called for an educational system that would create a class of anglicised Indians who would serve as cultural intermediaries between the British and the Indians. British education became solidified into India as missionary schools were established during the 1820s. Macaulay succeeded in replacing Persian with English, as the administrative language, the use of English as the medium of instruction, and the training of English-speaking Indians as teachers, through the English Education Act 1835. He was inspired by utilitarian ideas and called for useful learning. In 1854, the Woods Dispatch to the then Governor General Dalhousie stipulated a number of reforms be made to the company's education system in British India. The effectiveness of the measures stipulated in the Woods Dispatch were subsequently reviewed and a number of subsequent changes made following the publication of William Hunter's report of the Indian Education Commission 1882 in 1883. Topic. Universities India established a dense educational network very largely for males with a Western curriculum based on instruction in English. To further advance their careers many ambitious upper-class men with money, including Gandhi, Nehru and Muhammad Ali Jinnah went to England, especially to obtain a legal education at the Inns of Court. By 1890 some 60,000 Indians had matriculated, chiefly in the liberal arts or law. About a third entered public administration, and another third became lawyers. The result was a very well-educated professional state bureaucracy. By 1887 of 21,000 mid-level civil service appointments, 45% were held by Hindus, 7% by Muslims, 19% by Eurasians one European parent and one Indian, and 29% by Europeans. Of the 1,000 top-level positions, almost all were held by Britons, typically with an Oxbridge degree. The Raj, often working with local philanthropists, opened 186 colleges and universities. Starting with 600 students scattered across four universities and 67 colleges in 1882, the system expanded rapidly. More exactly, there never was a 
system under the Raj, as each state acted independently and funded schools for Indians from mostly private sources. By 1901 there were five universities and 145 colleges, with 18,000 students almost all male. The curriculum was Western. By 1922 most schools were under the control of elected provincial authorities, with little role for the national government. In 1922 there were 14 universities and 167 colleges, with 46,000 students. In 1947 21 universities and 496 colleges were in operation. Universities at first did no teaching or research, they only conducted examinations and gave out degrees. The Madras Medical College opened in 1835, and admitted women so that they could treat the female population who traditionally shied away from medical treatments under qualified male professionals. The concept of educated women among medical professionals gained popularity during the late 19th century and by 1894, the Women's Christian Medical College, an exclusive medical school for women, was established in Ludhiana in Punjab. The British established the Government College University in Lahore, of present-day Pakistan in 1864. The institution was initially affiliated with the University of Calcutta for examination. The prestigious University of the Punjab, also in Lahore, was the fourth university established by the colonials in South Asia, in the year 1882. Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental College, founded in 1875, was the first modern institution of higher education for Muslims in India. By 1920 it became the Aligarh Muslim University and was the leading intellectual centre of Muslim political activity. The original goals were to train Muslims for British service and prepare an elite that would attend universities in Britain. After 1920 it became a centre of political activism. Before 1939, the faculty and students supported an all-India nationalist movement. However, when the Second World War began political sentiment shifted toward demands for a Muslim separatist movement. The intellectual support it provided proved significant in the success of Jinnah and the Muslim League. Amongst the universities founded in the period are the, University of Bombay 1857, University of Calcutta 1857, University of Madras 1857, University of the Punjab 1882, University of Mysore 1916, Patna University 1917, Asmania University 1918, Rangoon University 1920, University of Lucknow 1921, University of Dhaka 1921, University of Delhi 1922, Nagpur University 1923, Andhra University 1926, Agra University 1927, Animalai University 1929, University of Kerala 1937, Utkal University 1943, Panjab University 1947, University of Rajputana 1947 Engineering <inaudible> <inaudible> The East India Company in 1806 set up Haleybury College in England to train administrators. In India, there were four colleges of civil engineering, the first was Thomason College now IIT founded in 1847. The second was Bengal Engineering College now Indian Institute of Engineering, Science and Technology, IIEST. Their role was to provide civil engineers for the Indian Public Works Department. Both in Britain and in India, the administration and management of science, technical and engineering education was undertaken by officers from the Royal Engineers and the Indian Army equivalent, commonly referred to as sapper officers. This trend in civil, military relationships continued with the establishment of the Royal Indian Engineering College also known as Cooper's Hill College in 1870, specifically to train civil engineers in England for duties with the Indian Public Works Department. He Indian Public Works Department, although technically a civilian organisation, relied on military engineers until 1947 and after. Growing awareness for the need of technical education in India gave rise to establishment of institutions such as the Indian Institute of Science, established by philanthropist Jamshet G. Tata in 1909. By the 1930s India had ten institutions offering engineering courses. However, with the advent of the Second World War in 1939 the War Technicians Training Scheme under Ernest Bevan was initiated, thereby laying the foundation of modern technical education in India. Later, planned development of scientific education under Ardashir Dalal was initiated in 1944. Topic: 
Criticism According to Indian National Congress President C. Sankaran Nair, 1919, Minute of Dissent, British government restricted indigenous education, efforts were then made by the government to confine higher education and secondary education leading to higher education to boys in affluent, circumstances. This again was done not in the interests of sound education but for political reasons. Rules were made calculated to restrict the diffusion of education generally and among the poorer boys in particular. Conditions for recognition for grants, stiff and various, were laid down and enforced, and the non-fulfillment of any one of these conditions was liable to be followed by serious consequences. Fees were raised to a degree which considering the circumstances of the classes that resort to schools, were abnormal. When it was objected that the minimum fee would be a great hardship to poor students the answer was, such students had no business to receive that kind of education. Managers of private schools who remitted fees in whole or in part were penalized by reduced grants in aid. Many schools were against the high fee but those who accepted it were given grants by British government. Along with fixed fee there was fixed timetable, printed books etc. Students had to attend regular classes which was a problem for students belonging to peasant families. These rules had undoubtedly the effect of checking the great expansion of education that would have taken place. This is the real explanation of the very unsatisfactory character of the nature and progress of secondary education and it will never be remedied till we are prepared either to give education to the boys ourselves or to make sufficient grants to the private schools to enable them to be staffed with competent teachers. We are at present not prepared to do either. English education, according to this policy, is to be confined to the well-to-do classes, they, it was believed, would give no trouble to government. For this purpose, the old system of education under which a pupil could prosecute his studies from the lowest to the highest class was altered. Freikenberg examines the 1784-1854 period to argue that education helped integrate the diverse elements Indian society, thereby creating a new common bond from among conflicting loyalties. The native elite demanded modern education. The University of Madras, founded in 1857, became the single most important recruiting ground for generations of ever more highly trained officials. This exclusive and select leadership was almost entirely clean caste, and mainly Brahmin. It held sway in both the imperial administration and within princely governments to the south. The position of this Mandarin class was never seriously challenged until well into the 20th century. Ellis argues that historians of Indian education have generally confined their arguments to very narrow themes linked to colonial dominance and education as a means of control, resistance, and dialogue. Ellis emphasizes the need to evaluate the education actually experienced by most Indian children, which was outside the classroom. Public education expenditures varied dramatically across regions with the western and southern provinces spending three to four times as much as the eastern provinces. The reason involved historical differences in land taxes. However the rates of attendance and literacy were not nearly as skewed. <laughs> Bihar and Bengal villages Ja argues that local schools for pre-adolescent children were in a flourishing state in thousands of villages of Bihar and Bengal until the early decades of the 19th century. They were village institutions, maintained by village elders with local funds, where their children from all caste clusters and communities could, if the father wished, receive useful skills. However, the British policies in respect of education and land control adversely affected both the village structure and the village institutions of secular education. The British legal system and the rise of caste consciousness since the second half of the 19th century made it worse. Gradually, village as the base of secular identity and solidarity became too weak to create and maintain its own institution by the end of the 19th century and the traditional system decayed. Science Kumar argues the British rule during the 19th century did not take adequate measures to help develop Western science and technology in India and instead focused more on arts and humanities. Till 1899 only the University of Bombay offered a separate degree in sciences. In 1899 BSc and MSc, courses were also supported by the University of Calcutta. By the late 19th century India had lagged behind in Western science and technology and related education. 
However, the nobility and aristocracy in India largely continued to encourage the development of sciences and technical education, both traditional and Western, while some science related subjects were not allowed in the government curriculum in the 1850s. The private institutions could also not follow science courses due to lack of funds required to establish laboratories, etc. The fees for scientific education under the British rule were also high. The salary that one would get in the colonial administration was meagre and made the prospect of attaining higher education bleak since the native population was not employed for high positions in the colonial setup. Even the natives who did manage to attain higher education faced issues of discrimination in terms of wages and privileges. Kumar goes on to argue that the British detachment towards the study of Western science in India is that England itself was gradually outpaced in science and technology by European rival Germany and a fast growing United States, so the prospects of the British Raj adopting a world class science policy towards its colonies increasingly decreased. However, Deepak Kumar notes the British turned to professional education during the 1860s and the French initiatives at raising awareness on science and technology in French colonies. See also List of colonial universities in British India Notes <laughs> <laughs>